We are in Parashat Shmot. Uh, we're getting uh, introduced to Moshe Rabbeinu. Oh Hashem, our hero. <coughs> In this uh, parasha, not only did we get introduced to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu has his uh, meeting with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And of course the meeting is done in the mountain. Moshe Rabbeinu goes out for a walk with the goats and he sees a burning bush. And uh, he doesn't understand how the, burn, the, the bush, the fire is not burning the bush, how it's not consuming it. It's interesting because the Torah is talking about the birth of Moshe Rabbeinu, a little bit about uh, his life, and then uh, he disappears for 62 years. And the Torah is not talking about where he was, what he did. And suddenly, you know, he's back into the picture when he's 80 years old. <coughs> Nevertheless, <coughs> we see in the parasha that Moshe Rabbeinu is uh, minding his own business, enjoying retirement. He's uh, 80 years old, takes walks in the morning, and one day, oh, he sees the snare in front of him. So we're in the Noam Elimelech learning. Uh, there's a lot of ma'amarim in the, the parasha of Shemot. Uh, let's just count so you see where we are. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The twelfth ma'amar in, depending which uh, version you have. Uh, the ma'amar starts with O Yamar Vayira Elav Mitoch Asne. In my version, it's uh, page 124. <coughs> and again, the ma'amar starts with Vayira Elav Mitoch Asne. So we know Moshe Rabbeinu is walking. On the mountain, then he sees a bush going up on fire, and he's looking at the bush, and the fire is not consuming the bush. And later on, Hashem reveals himself from the snake, from the bush. The snake is the bush. And the Mamar starts, and he appeared to him, from within the burning bush, the snake. And here you see the snake is burning. He sees that the bush is not being burnt by the fire and he's asking, how can it be? How can it be that the fire is burning the bush but the bush is not being consumed by the fire? So first we have to explain the specific way how it's uh, written because the, 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 the Lashon, the, the grammar here, changes. First of all, it says, <coughs> The Sneh does not get, uh, it doesn't say the word burnt, rather ukal. Ukal means that uh, consumed. The right uh, translation actually is digested. Like, uh, like uh, you know, ochel is food, but when you digest something, is uh, ikul. Even though ikul is with the letter ein, but nevertheless, the 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 same uh, idea is that the the, the, bur the, the bush is not being, uh, so to say, the, uh, consumed. And digesting and consume is the same idea. Later on he says, Why isn't the sne being burnt? So the first time he's asking, why isn't the sne, the bush, being uh, consumed? And the second time he says, why isn't it being burnt? I mean, when the Torah tells you something, and it's the same idea, but with different uh, words, then there's obviously something hinting there, there's some type of a secret in there. The thing is that most people when they read out from the Torah, they don't pay attention to every little word. They just read it fast and very few people have the observation to say, hey, how come you said this and now you said that? So here, 
the normal Limelech makes an observation, how come in the beginning you're saying the sne lo ukal, and later on the sne lo boer, it doesn't get uh, burnt. Velo yivar hasne. Vaya lo lomar, madua lo neechal hasne. It would make much more sense to say why wouldn't the sne was eaten or digested. I mean, the word that he's using, ukal, resembles neechal, to being eaten. How come he's not saying madua lo neechal hasne? And he says ukal hasne. Again, this is different words, how to, uh, different words how to say the word. And he's wondering wh why he's saying that, because obviously there's a hint there. And it seems, al derech ha-musar, dehine ha-tzadikim gam ha-yetzer ha-ra nefach eleim letov. It seems, when we're explaining that uh, based on teachings of Musar, that the Tzadikim, their Yetzer Ara also turns, they were able to transform their Yetzer Ara to good. Kmo shekatuv, bechol levavcha, bechol, meaning in, in Kriyat Shema, Kriyat Shema, we say, bechol levavcha, meaning with both of your Yetzerim, with Yetzer Tov and Yetzer Ara. Af al pichen, en laamin laatzmo, Nevertheless, one should not believe in himself too much. You always have to be very cautious. The Yetzirah, you sometimes feel that you change them. And you, he, he's actually feeding you that you are such a tzaddik that you transform him to be good. And he tells you when you look in the mirror, wow, look at that beard. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have such a beard. And wow, look at the tzitzit, four of them you got. You are a tzaddik, and you made me a tzaddik too. And the tzaddik tells you, you made me a tzaddik, I go with you to shul every day. And I eat kosher like you, you made me a bar tshuva. And then he's waiting for you for a second not to look. That's when he puts you the, the knife between your ribs. Af al pichen, en laamin laatzmo, a person should not believe in himself too much. That he's in such a high level. One constantly needs to be careful from the advice of the Yetzirah. It says in the Sne that an angel of Hashem has appeared to Moshe Rabbeinu in the flame. The Yetzirah is also called the Malach. He's uh, also an angel. פירוש, what does it mean? הוא מראה עצמו לצדיק בהתלהבות גדול. He shows himself to you with a lot of excitement, like fire. Excitement to do a mitzvah, excitement to wake up early, excitement to learn, excitement to become observant. He just shows it to you, as it's mentioned above. שנפח גם הוא לטוב. He always pretending, the Yetzirah likes to pretend that he's became, he became good. He gives you a week, two, three weeks, a month, quiet. Doesn't bother you too much. So you suddenly start feeling, hey, wait a minute, I think I got rid of him. Hey, he didn't bother me now for the last three weeks. That's it, I probably killed him. He makes it appear like as if he got transformed into good. In the beginning, he shows it like a bush. And Moshe Rabbeinu is looking at the bush and he sees that it's burning with fire. Perush, what does that mean? The Amara Katov, the script explains, Afal Pisha Roesha Sneho Yetzerara. He sees that the Sne is representing the Yetzerara. Gamken Boer Baesh Bitlavodut Bitlavut, Lavodat Abore, Ibarach Shmo. He shows the Yetzerara is showing you that he's excited to serve Hashem also. He's uh, helping you to go to shul, helping you to go at four o'clock in the morning to the mikveh. He's uh, showing excitement. But nevertheless, the sne doesn't get digested, doesn't get consumed. What is he trying to tell you? You have to be very careful with the tzerara, because he knows how to sometimes back off, so you'll have a good run. And you will feel that that's it, that I did it. I was able to overpower him. He's not bothering me now. Sometimes he lets you go for like half a year. Half a year. Nobody's knocking on the door. Every day you go to shul, to the minyanim, you learn everything is good. You forget that he's there. He's there. 
is letting you get used to the situation that everything is good, and then, then he attacks again. That's why it says, You have to be very careful from the Yetzirah till the last day of your life. Like the sages say in Pirkei Avot, Don't believe in yourself till the day you die. Don't come and say, oh, that's it, look, how, psh, look at this nice beard, nice black suit. That's it. I'm sitting with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, minimum. What does Moshe Rabbeinu says? Let me move away and observe again. Asurana, I will move away. Let me look what's going on here. We constantly grow from one level to another level. When you really put your mind to your Avodat Hashem, you, you really uh, are aware of everything that you're doing. You're not doing it like a robot. Unfortunately, many people, how they serve Hashem is robotic. It's like a system. Wake up in the morning, mikveh, praying, eating, mincha, marev, this, that. Uh, everything is like a robot going to sleep and they're doing everything but like literally, literally like a machine there's no uh, there's no hergesh there's no feeling here what am I doing did I pray today shacharit like I prayed yesterday or what am I doing here a lot of people unfortunately they come and they do their avodat Hashem they do it but like a like a evid like a like a amen like a slave there's no uh, life here now, a person that really wants to uh, uh, focus on, on his Avodat Hashem has to really focus on every day. How was my pray today? Was I prayed really good today? Or maybe it was uh, not so good like, uh, like yesterday? To make a, every day an account. That's why I constantly talk about Riyach Malamita. Because you allow yourself five minutes, ten minutes during the day to sit and to say, okay, nobody's here, nobody's watching. And let me make a quick account. How was my day today? I gave enough charity? Did I was courteous enough to every person that looked at me? And maybe where am I lacking? Maybe I didn't pray with the right kavanah. Well, to I'm supposed to do this when I say Shema at night on my bed? Uh, you can say that 50 times a day. Well, if, uh, but if you don't have the time to say it 50 times a day, then uh, at least make yourself one time in the, mi in the end of the day that you sit on your bed, it's the end of the day already. Nobody's bothering you, you don't have to go anywhere. I'm not saying while you're saying Kriyat Shema Lamita. You want to do it five minutes before. So Kriyat Shema Lamita, you already did Cheshbon Nefesh and you already did your Tshuva. You want to come and say Kriyat Shema after you did Tshuva. So if you have the awareness every hour, you can do your Hidbon Enut once an hour and make a stop for two, three minutes and say, how was my last hour? I wasn't nice to that guy, I was late to the minyan. When I prayed, I only focused on five of the brachot and not on the all 18 of the brachot. You can make a quick analogy. This is a Eved Hashem Be'emet. A Eved Hashem Be'emet that is constantly looking at himself and, uh, and analogy, anal analyzing himself. You finish a, co a, co a conversation, I mean, li listen, we're not, uh, we're not stupid. If you hurt somebody with your speech, you know that. It's uh, usually your ego that says, ah! But you finish your conversation, you can right away say, you know what, I, I was a little bit too much uh, rough with this guy. Or I was talking with, from a place of ego. Or maybe I was too nice. I'm not really talking from that side. Maybe I was too nice. That person needed to get a little bit, a little bit more of a, uh, a firmness from here. But nevertheless, I always do that, especially with my kids. That's why kids are the best education system for yourself. People think that they're educating the kids. If you are humble, the kids really teach you. And every encounter that I have with one of my kids, I analyze it right away. It's very easy to lose your temper on, on a kid, very easy. It's very easy to feel that you're higher than the kid. Oh, what are you talking about? I know better than you. It's very easy to lose yourself in front of a kid because you're also physically bigger than the kid. So by default, you're thinking you're smarter, you're stronger, you're better, have more experience, I brought you to the world. That's all these qualities that pump up your ego. I'm better, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. 
So if you're humble, you look at the kid, a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and you learn from the kid. Listen, David the Melech said, Mikol Milam Daiskalti. David the Melech was a very wise man. And he was able to be so humble to say, I have learned from everybody. So I uh, specifically analyze my conversations with my kids and to see if I'm really humble. Because if I can talk humble to a four-year-old or a six-year-old and listen to them, listen to their opinion, apologize. I don't know many parents that apologize to the child. I understand sometimes you lose your temper. That's a total normal thing. I'm not saying that it's a good thing. It's normal that you come home from work, you're busy, you're stressed, there's a lot of pressure sometimes, you snap at the kid. I don't know many parents that turn around later to the kid and says, listen, you know, I'm very sorry, I had a, a hard day today and my boss is driving me crazy or the bank account doesn't look so good or whatever it is and I'm a little bit stressed. I'm very sorry I, I, I let it out on you. You shouldn't get my stress on you. I'm sorry, I want to apologize to you. Do you forgive me? I don't know many parents that do that. So this is a real uh, working on your, on your midata anava. The po point is, 100%. The kids are growing up messed up because they, they, the parents, it's, it's their, their parents' punching bag. And some kids are weak and they just absorb it. Some kids are stronger, they rebel. Some kids are just uh, become numb. So somebody sent me not too long ago a very interesting video online. It's like a cartoon. And you see a kid, it probably looks like three-year-old, five-year-old, whatever. And the kid goes to the father and like, goes like this to the father and says, hey, can you play ball with me? Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not saying it exactly, and I'll tell you the idea. I don't remember every little sentence there. But the father says, no, 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 I'm busy. He pushes him off. And then you see the kid a little bit bigger, and he pulls the father's... Uh, uh, Shriv, can you read with me? And the father pushes, no, 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 I'm busy now, I'm busy now. And you see the father with a phone and a computer. And the, you see the cartoon, the kid grows and grows and grows. And every time the kid goes to the father and asks the father for some time. And the father shoes him off, I'm busy, I'm busy. And then you see the kid already a teenager. You see, like, the, the cartoon is done nice. You know, this, you see the teenager, like, with big ear, earphones and you know, the, the clothes change, and then the father goes to the teenager to ask him, and you see the teenager goes like this, like, leave me alone, I don't have time for you. And the father's like, you know, for 15 years, I never had time to my kid. Now when I want to turn to my kid, he doesn't give me a time a day even. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I really look at my entire encounters with my kids to my Avodat Hashem. It's very easy to shoo the kid off when you're really busy or stressed, but the right, uh, the right way is like, wait a minute, I, I, my kid will come to me, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I will stop everything that I'm doing and give the kid the, the utmost attention. Yes, how can I help you? Even if it's going to be the most ridiculous thing ever. And this is, the kid really teaches you anava and patience and control and irat, irat Hashem. So this is the Eved Hashem, that he's look at, he looks at everything in his life and he learns from that and derives from that how can I get a much, become a much better person. Now it's our ego and our, our arrogance and my self-centered uh, emotions that pushes everything away and I don't understand that the Shem, how Hashem is governing the world that every encounter that I have even it can be with an animal, it can be with the, with the weather, it doesn't matter. Shem is trying to show me something so I can analyze it quickly, not to sit there for half an hour. Analyze it quickly and apply it to my Avodat Hashem. Is the same apply to our wives too? Yeah, 100%. Your wife is your, is your mirror. So all the midot that you need to work on, your wife is going to be the master of the one who's going to be the tuning the midot. If you have to work on patience, then your wife is going to be the one who's going to press all the buttons. That's for sure. Yeah, and if you have to work on anger, then your wife is going to be... She's going to be driving you nuts. And if you have to work on Ahavat Israel, You know, the real Ahavat Israel is with your wife, by the way. The real Ahavat Israel is between a man and wife. <coughs> so your wife is going to be designed perfectly to make sure that she's pressing on all the right buttons. 
Negdo is your mirror and Ezer. She's going to refine you. You know, the Ari explains that most of the time the women don't get reincarnated. Women go into Genom. Because a man that has a little bit of Torah can go into Genom. He has to get reincarnated. The woman that didn't learn Torah, she can go into Genom. She can go get cleansed in Genom and uh, go back to Gan Eden. Many times the woman part of the soul will come down to the world to assist the man. Ezer Kenegdo. So we have to thank our wives because I need to work on my midot. I need to work on refining my character. If you think that Hashem is getting impressed because you come three times a day to shul, he's happy. That's not what's impressing Hashem. You think that when you sit here now for four hours and learning Torah, you're impressing Hashem? Hashem is looking down and says, what are you talking about? I have Rabbi Meir in Shemaim. I have Rabbi Akiva, I have Rabbi Shimon. Your Torah is this big. You're impressing Hashem when you're working on yourself. When you look yourself at the mirror and you say, how am I becoming a better husband? And not to say it's her fault. To say, where, 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 where can I become a much better man? And Hashem was kind enough to me to put a woman in front of me that can tolerate my nonsense and, and allow me to refine myself. It's only our ego that is saying it's her fault. She's driving me crazy. She's messy. She's noisy. She's the, this and that. It's my ego. Yeah, 100%. So a real Eved Hashem is looking around constantly. This is a Eved Hashem is a servant of Hashem. Now Hashem doesn't need your favors. Hashem is comfortably sitting up there. He doesn't need you to do him any favors. You're not doing him any favor by coming to shul three times a day and learning Torah. Hashem wants to, you to refine yourself. That's why our sages say, we read that every day, Ratsa HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot Et Yisrael Lefichach Nirba Lehem Torah Mitzvot Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give you a lot of merits, therefore he gave you a lot of Torah and a lot of mitzvot. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, don't say lezakot, say lezakech. Hashem wanted to refine you. So he gave you a lot of mitzvot and a lot of work to do. So a real humble individual looks at every person that they have an encounter with him and says, how that is that person refining me right now? Most people look at the person in front of them and says, what does this guy want from me now? Why is he bothering me? And how can I prove to the world that I'm better than that person? That's the wrong attitude. So Moshe Rabbeinu was the ultimate, the ultimate midat anava. Vaishaya anav mikol. Moshe Rabbeinu, why did he reach such a level? Because he was humble. Moshe Rabbeinu reached to a level of prophecy that nobody ever reached. All the prophets, the greatest of all, Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel, the greatest prophets. All the prophecy was while they were sleeping. Moshe Rabbeinu would talk to Hashem like, as if, like uh, when he was up. So Moshe Rabbeinu was able to reach to such a high level also to receive the Torah and to give it. There, there's a, to some opinions, there is a machloket, but most opinions say that Moshe Rabbeinu will be a greater, greater prophet than Mashiach. And Mashiach will be greater in many other things. But Moshe Rabbeinu is coming with Mashiach, by the way. Moshe, Mashiach is coming with one side Moshe Rabbeinu, one side Aaron Cohen, Because Aaron is going to have to teach all the Kohanim right away what to do. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to have to learn halacha, is to teach us the halacha. I mean, he's Rabbeinu. Mashiach is Melech, he's the king. So some, most opinions say Moshe Rabbeinu will still be a greater prophet than Mashiach. Some say no, he's not going to be greater, that Mashiach will be the ultimate, but we're not going to argue right now, let's let them come and then we'll see. I hear all the time that some people say that uh, Mashiach is Moshe Rabbeinu. So what do you just said now, that people say that Moshe Rabbeinu is from Shevet Levi, okay. and Mashiach is from Shevet Yehuda. Moshe Rabbeinu is not Melech HaMashiach, Moshe Rabbeinu is the first Mashiach. And the tzotz of Moshe Rabbeinu is in, in, in our Mashiach. But how can he be? Even now in this parasha, Moshe knew he's not going to be Mashiach. You know, we're just now talking about the Sneh. You know that there was negotiation, seven days of negotiating. First day Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, I am not going, I don't want the job. Hashem tells him, I want you to go and redeem my kids, get my kids out of your Mitzrayim. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm sorry, please find somebody else. I don't want the job. Hashem is telling you, are you, are you joking? 
I'm making you now, Moshe Rabbein, you don't want the job? Moshe Rabbein says, I don't want to go to Mitzrayim. Why would Paro believe me? Why would Paro listen to me? So Hashem says, don't worry, I'm going to kvetch him. He'll listen to you. Next day, Moshe Rabbeinu again says, I'm sorry. No, no, no. The next day he comes again. The, uh, the, the sne appears to him. It doesn't say it in the script. The second day, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't even know who you are. Says to Hashem, I don't even know who you are. If you want me to be your salesman, I don't even know who you are. Hashem tells him, okay, I'll tell you who I am. I'm Eheyeh. Let me reveal to you. Reveals to him such a high level of godly revelation. Nobody ever reached to that level. He says, no, sorry. No, 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 no can do. I don't want the job. Comes the third day. He tells him, I'm very sorry. The, the Bnei Israel will not listen to me. Why would they listen to me? She says, were you talking to Hashanah about my kids? Are you talking to Hashanah about my kids? Put your hand in your jacket. He puts his hand, take it out. Oh, full of tzarat. Don't talk to Hashanah about my kids. The fourth day, he comes and says, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot do the job, I stutter. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu used to, be a, 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 used to stutter. That's literally he would stutter? He would literally stutter because only when he spoke regular, when he spoke Torah, he wouldn't stutter. Because when he was young, you know the story, he went to Paro, took his crown off his head, and the advisors there said, he's going to be, he's going to take your kingship, king, kingship, and uh, anyways, the whole story, and then the, the, he took a coal, coal, coal from the coal, and uh, Malach Gabriel came and pushed it into his mouth. He put it in his mouth. He burnt his mouth. It's a whole story in the Midrash. Nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu was stuttering. So he says, I can't do the job. I stutter. Every day there was a negotiation. And I said, Moshe Rabbeinu says, leave me alone. What do you want? I, I'm retired. Didn't you see me to that zoot? I'm 80 years old. What do you want from me now? We're giving me a headache now. I had a whole life now suffering so you know we're, we're we think we we have a hard life wait a minute Moshe Rabbeinu when he was 40 got a job nevertheless Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want the job and Moshe Rabbeinu reached first of all he didn't want the job because he was enough me I, I can do such a thing and Moshe Rabbeinu was able to reach to the highest level of prophecy because he was so humble and he was so humble that he was able to receive the Torah and, and he had all the, the, the power to be arrogant. You know, with the machloket with Korach, Korach comes and argues with him. And uh, when you really an analyze the story, Korach, first of all, was a cousin. He was part of the family. So that is some guy came from the street. Korach was a cousin. You know, Korach comes in to Moshe and says, who made you king? <laughs> who made you the authority to give your brother to become the coin, you made yourself king, you're giving all the jobs here to whoever you want, you would think that Moshe Rabbeinu will react accordingly. Now again, Mo Korach was not some shmo from the street. First of all, he was a cousin. Second of all, Korach was like a, a Bill Gates. He was a billionaire. He was the most richest individual in the generation then. Up until today in Israel, you say on a person that is rich, you say, Ashir Ka Korach. More than that, he was a Talmud Chacham. He was able to convince 200 head of Sanhedraot of Supreme Courts at the time. Everybody was with Korach. I told you the story with Ace Mahmoshe that said that he was a Gilgul at the time. That he says everybody went to, to Korach in, the, in this Machloket. Barely anybody went with Moshe Rabbeinu. So you would think that in this argument, Moshe Rabbeinu will get up to Korach and react. What are you talking to? You know who I am? Be quiet, go back to your place where you came out from. Yeah, I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm the king of Israel. I took the Jews out of Mitzrayim. I went up on the mountain and got the Torah. How dare you even talk to me? Moshe Rabbeinu had all the authority to put him down and to make him this big. Moshe Rabbeinu, you know what the Torah says? Vayipol al panav vayevk. He fell on his face and started crying. Saying, maybe I did something wrong. Oh my gosh, maybe Korach is right. Maybe I messed up. Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble man in history. That's why he came to such a high level. So, when he says here, Asur ere, let me move back and, li and look, is, Ere means let me look, let me observe. Moshe Rabbeinu is coming and teaching us, everything that happens to you, don't react. Take a step back. Asur ana, Asur is, I will move back. And let me observe, observe what's going on here. It's 
one of the worst things is to act impulsively. Yeah, Moshe Rabbeinu knew he's not going to be Mashiach. That's the thing. I'm sorry, I, I got distracted. When Moshe Rabbeinu was uh, 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 negotiating, so to say, Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end, after seven days of negotiation, Moshe Rabbeinu came with another two arguments, and he said, why don't you go to my brother? I have an older brother. It's not respectful that the younger brother gets the job. Go to my brother, Aaron. He's three years older than me. Go to him. So Moshe, as though Hashem says, no, 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 I'm not accepting that. And then Moshe Rabbeinu says, go to Mashiach. Go, you, there is going to be a Mashiach. Go to him. What do you want from me? I'm not Mashiach. So Moshe knew he's not going to be Mashiach. I mean, Moshe wasn't stupid. Moshe says, Mashiach is coming from the Shevet Yehuda. Yaakov just told us that last week. Moshe Rabbeinu read this uh, Parashat HaShavua. And he says, well, I just see that my grandfather Yaakov, uh, he gave the... the the, the Yehuda to be uh, uh, Mashiach is going to come out from Yehuda I'm from Shevet Levi of course I'm not Mashiach so he said to, to, to Hashem what do you want from me? go to Mashiach let him uh, deal with this headache so Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu you're right but you are the first Mashiach you're going to start the Geula you're going to start paving the redemption you're right there's going to come somebody after that that's going to be Mashiach Okay, I think what you're talking about is what it says in the Zohar, that every generation there is a hemshechiyut, there's a continuation of a spark of Moshe Rabbeinu. Every generation there's a Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. A certain spark that is being given from one generation to another, there's always going to be one Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. That if that generation, Mashiach should come, there's a candidate. He's there already. It doesn't mean it's actually Moshe Rabbeinu. I mean, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is a reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is also going to be with us in the Gira, but the reincarnation is, it means a spark, a part of the soul jumps to another soul, and 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 it continues. Asura, you say? Excuse me. Asura. Asura, no, Asura. You can uh, translate it as prohibited. Like a woman, she's Asura. A married woman, she's considered prohibited for a man to touch her. This is Asura. This is uh, when you get engaged, the word for uh, a fiancé is arusa. She's, uh, she's, uh, she's uh, saved for this man. If you've ever been to a chupa, you hear the rabbi saying, hamatirat asurot, untying the forbidden woman to be given to this man. Asura, uh, asura, asura means to move back. It's lasur. <coughs> not to move back. Asura means to, to, to move back. Asura na, le, please let me go back for a second and observe. Ve'ere. Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching us. <laughs> Don't be impulsive. You know, Reuven, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, Reuven lost his Bechora because he was impulsive. Last week, when Yaakov was giving the, everybody the... Uh, the Tochecha, giving them chimp, a coat on their head. What did he tell Reuven? You lost your, became, Yehuda took it. Yehuda is number four. And he became, so to say, the Bechor. Yaakov told him, you lost your Bechora because you acted impulsively. To act impulsively is one of the biggest stumble blocks one can, uh, one can have. You have to be very uh, uh, calculated, very, you know, don't, don't, don't react so fast. Anyways, let's continue a little bit. Maybe we'll just continue tomorrow. So would that, would that be the Cheshbon and Nefesh? That would be um, a sort of group yourself and think about it? Yeah. That would be the Cheshbon and Nefesh. Asura, when you step back, this is your Cheshbon Nefesh. Now, I said, uh, I gave you a discount. I told you to do it once a day. Tiet Kriyat Shema Lamita. You want to do, do, do it the right way? Do it every hour. Do it every encounter. Somebody now says something to you, it's very easy to right away react. The right way is to asura, move back a little bit, think. Worst case, you don't react at all. It doesn't, and not everything needs a reaction. And you know what? The reactions that come impulsively are usually the destructive ones. And the reactions that come later are the right reactions. You don't have to react right away. Sometimes, you know, being quiet is also good. 
let's uh, let's uh, wrap it up here. Bezat Hashem will continue tomorrow the next part of the Ma'amar, but uh, we're, le- we're learning here some you know one of the most valuable valuable uh, lessons in our in our life. How important it is to really look at every situation and not be impulsive in my reaction. And uh, this is, you know, on a, an a, on a immediate level. But a real Eved Hashem, that's what he's saying here, that uh, a, a real servant of God observes everything that happens to him too throughout the day and makes an, an analogy right away. Analysis. So we don't have a style here to fix, the, to fix the grammar. Yeah, to me, you want to make an analysis right away. That's a real Eved Hashem. Because right away you can apologize, and right away you can uh, reverse the problem that you did. This is the highest level you can reach in the in the in the in avodat tshuva. Because if you don't do it right away, the next day you forgot already. You can forget from the morning till the night. How can you do tshuva on something you don't remember? That's why on Yom Kippur we say, and when we do the alchet, we say for all the things that I just mentioned, and the things that I forgot. Because how can you do, this is the, what, the, the, what we pray on Yom Kippur. How can you do tshuva? You can say something in the morning and in the evening you totally forgot. Sometimes you leave your house in the morning and you say something to, hurtful to your wife, to your kid. You forgot at the end of the day. You come home and your wife has a sour face. What's wrong, honey? You said something. No, first she'll torture you for an hour. Nothing. Everything is fine. No, but you seem like you're troubled. No! Everything is great. And then after a whole hour of negotiating, finally she was like, well, you said this and this and that in the morning. You still holding it? Do you remember? What, uh, I, I've already forgot. Oh, I didn't forget, honey. I did not forget. So you tend to forget things very fast. You, I mean we. And we don't know how to do tshuva right away. Now, if a person is very, very aware of every little action that happens, then they're constantly in the level of doing constant tshuva so you can rectify right away your behavior. That's what he's saying here, that, that uh, uh, where was he saying that, sorry? We'll just read it again. We're constantly going from one level to another. That you is to be very, uh, uh, what's the word, latmid? Is that you, uh, diligence, diligence, not diligence, uh, delegant? No. Diligent. Diligent. You're very persistent. You're, you're doing it, you know, carefully. And, uh, and not only that, you're doing it be'emet, with, with truth, uvetamim, with uh, being very humble and innocent. Not uh, ka- it, it's in the... Latmid. Lamed hey. Taf. Taf. Mem yu dalet. You think that it works to say, Shem, I can't remember all the things I've done, I'm sorry for every time I broke up, do you think that works? Or do you know if you don't remember the exact thing? To persevere. Okay, Latmin is to persevere, by the way. It's to persevere in your Avodat Hashem. To say to Hashem, uh, uh, please forgive me for everything I forgot, of course it's valid. Because you can come when you're doing your tshuva and you say to Hashem, Hashem, listen, I'm uh, 50, I'm 40. I think I remember what I did when I was 17. I don't remember what I did when I was 21. What's the, what's so, Tommy, Tommy is continuing. Exactly. Well, so, you know, if like I forgot to do a. Do a yeah, the so first. The day before, does it work the day before? Even after I don't well, you can do it every day. It's not that every day you'll pretend that you forgot things and you say, Hashem, whatever I forget, forgive me. Yeah, so, that's Hashem is going to tell you what you're suffering from amnesia. What do you mean, whatever you forget? When you start your process of tshuva, then you can say, listen, Hashem, for what happened 20 years ago, I don't remember. But uh, you can come and say every day, uh, what I forgot yesterday, Hashem is going to say, well, who are you kidding here? Well, is that what it says in the paragraph? In Al-Khet, that's what we're saying. For everything that I said, for everything that I forgot and didn't say. Even if you have a notepad, it doesn't matter. You're going to yeah? forget something. You're always going to forget. But the right way to do tshuva is to constantly say, Hashem, Hashem, remind me what I need to do tshuva on. 
And I told you once, the Zohar says that if you really want to do the right tshuva, and you don't know where you failed 20 years ago, so Rabbi Shimon gives advice that if you stay up all night and you learn Torah, you're not staying up all night to watch movies, you stay up all night and you learn Torah the entire night, and in the morning you can pray to Hashem really from your heart and saying, Hashem, please help me do tshuva for the things I don't know that I forgot. And this is a very powerful thing that, uh, that I can swear that I did that and testify that it works. And, and I would stay up nights up and learn Torah and in the morning when I would pray, because it says a person that is up all night learning Torah, a string of chesed is, uh, is put on him the entire day. Nimshach al shel chesed. Kol aniyor mishnato bechol laila. A person that is up all night, nimshach al shel chesed. A string of chesed is like put on, on him. And I would pray in the morning, Hashem, I know I, I, I owe a lot of people money. I know I stole from people money. I know I hurt a lot of people. Help me do tshuva. People will just appear into my life out of nowhere. And I would suddenly remember, oh my gosh, I owe that person money. Oh my gosh, I did that. And for years, that's how I did my tshuva. You want to do tshuva the right way. This is the problem with it. But a lot of people that become observant, the yeshivot that they go to don't teach you that. Tshuva is not just to put a yamaka on your head and put a, a, a tzitzit and to look forward. That's great. But what about back? You have to start covering all the holes that you dug for the last 20, 30 years. And you have to do that. And the only way of doing it is you need a lot of sayata dishmaya, a lot of assistance from Hashem to allow you to remember all the things that you did and constantly to have in my mind what I don't remember I'm going to give extra for the things I don't remember. So I told you that I used to be very crooked in business before I became observant. I came uh, to a point that I was like, I don't even know who I stole money from. And we're talking here millions and millions of dollars. How am I going to ever repay them? I'll never even find them because I don't even know who they are. So the rabbi that I went to at the time, he told me, listen, uh, you want to fix that, then feed a lot of people on Shabbat. Constantly feed people on Shabbat. So for years, in the beginning when I became observant, I had a business. I used to support three shuls for their Shabbat meals. And I wouldn't just give them a check. I bought the food and I came to the shul with the food. So I can carry also the food and sweat with carrying the food. Nobody knew it was me. One of them was the shul where I used to pray. And another two shuls, nobody knew who was bringing the food. And I would hear all the comments, you know, nice comments. Oh Hashem, Hashem, bless the person who brought us this beautiful salmon. Now we're like, oh Hashem, Hashem, just, just, just take all this junk away. Just pay all my debts. And I would hear comments of people. And up until today, you see we're feeding people on Shabbat because I don't know how much money I owe. And I always tell Hashem, for the ones I don't remember, I'm giving now extra. I'm giving a lot of extra. Or maybe I forgot one, one little crumb somewhere from 20 years ago. Don't remind me that after 120 years. When I come to Shamayim and you take out all the books and tell me, oh, by the way, you missed one here. So, Tshuva is looking back, looking forward, of course, but you have to cover all the junk in the back. And I'm just giving an example with money. What about the people you hurt? I wasn't a, such a nice guy. I was like a bully. You know how many people I probably punched in their face? How many people I cursed? How many people I insulted in public? How many people I humiliated? How many people I made fun of? You, don't you think it's not going to come back to you at some point? So that's the ignorance of people when they do tshuva, they don't understand, wait a minute, I did some bad things 50 years ago. That might be knocking on my door one day, hello, remember me? You insulted me in public 50 years ago. I still remember that. When my, mom, when my wife made tshuva, she, she used to hunt people down and she called a girl, she found a girl that she used to make fun of her in third or fourth grade. My wife used to make fun of her. And she called the girl, she found her. And she called her and told her, do you remember me? I wanted to apologize to you. And the girl says, I remember you? I hated you. You made my life miserable. But I forgive you now. My wife called people, found them. And she, my wife says, I remember her. I remember being mean to her. And my wife, 30 years later, calls her and tells her, I, I want to apologize. I mean, I don't have an explanation why I did that. We were nine years old, but I still want to apologize. That's the real tshuva. Now this is far away. Far away, that's a long work. 
to do, but at least start with, the, with today. So when Hashem, listen, Hashem is very open and accepting all the tshuva, just be genuine, you have to be genuine and come up to Hashem and say, Hashem, I want to do tshuva, help me. I already figured it out, I understood what I did, what I didn't do, help me do tshuva here. And trust me, Hashem has all the ways in the world, He has records of all, He has archives of everything. Think if it's a problem for Hashem to pull out from an archive something you did, and I'm telling you, I used to do that, people would just show up in, in, my, in my face. People that I took money from, people that I stole from, people that I... I used to be, I used to bully some guy when I was in a high school, and suddenly I saw him in the middle of New York. I bump into him in the street. What are the odds? 11 million people, and I'm bumping into this guy on the street, and you have to seize the opportunity. He didn't even recognize me, looking like this. I told him, you remember me? No. I told him, come on. You don't remember me? And then when I told him, when I reminded him, he's like, he's like, he's like he saw a ghost. And I was like, you know, I really want to apologize for everything that I did to you. If there's anything, anything that I can do for the sorrow that I caused you. He started laughing. He couldn't, he couldn't even believe. And I told him, you know what, even if you accept or not, I'm going to read a whole book of Tehillim for you. I'm going to sit and read a whole book of Tehillim. So you will have some type of a compensation at some point. He didn't, he thought I'm nuts, but I don't care. And I sent him a whole book of Tilim. And one day he's going to come to Shemaim, they're going to come to him and tell him this is from Alon Nava. All the times that he's made jokes of you, here he gave you a book of Tilim. That's probably worth 500 trillion dollars in Shemaim. You know, maybe that's going to be what's going to save him one day. Maybe one day he's going to be tilting on a scale and Malach HaMavet already taking him to Genom, they'll be like, whoa, wait a minute. One time, Mr. Anaver, Anava, read a book of Tehillim, here that's yours. So you never know how things work. The point is the tshuva has to be real. That's why he says here, Be'emet. Be'emet can be translated as really, Be'emet, and it can also be read as Be, Be'emet, with Emet. The Avodah Tashem can only be done with emet. Yitain emet le'akov, it's all about emet. That's why Hashem cannot stand liars. Hashem despises liars. He doesn't care how much Torah you know. He doesn't care how black your suit is. He doesn't care how nice your hat and how much Torah you have in you. How much mitzvot, if you're the first one, open the show. He doesn't care if you lie. If you lie, everything is like nothing in the eyes of Hashem. Hashem cannot stand liars. Hashem is the ultimate, it's all about Emet. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu, in the, in the story with Korach, when the sons fell down in the Tshuva, what they scream? Moshe Emet. Moshe is the Emet. That is the Emet. And how they say in the courts in America, the truth and nothing but the truth. There's no 99% Emet. There's only Emet or not. Some people say, I'm, uh, he's 90% truthful. No, he's not. If he's 10% lying, then he's a liar. He's not truthful. You're either 100% or not in, in, when it comes to truth or lying. So it's all about a myth. And it starts with inside. I told you this 50 million times my story, how I told my wife I'm going to stop lying. And I told her I lie to, pe I lie to people, I lie to Hashem, and I lie to myself. When you lie to yourself, who do you think you're kidding? You're kidding yourself. So the Avodat Hashem has to be be'emet, like he says here. Uve Tamim. Tamim is innocence. That no, no agenda here. No, uh, no looking to, to, to be tricky. Tamim, if you remember yesterday we translated, a person is not looking to leramot, to cheat. That's Tamim. Honest. No, no, uh, no shticks here. No monkey business. What is absolute truth? Excuse me? What is absolute truth? Roshbuchu is the absolute truth. But that, the truth is that you, you don't distort the truth, that you don't make a new reality. I'm not saying it's easy, it's very hard. When I decided, when I took on myself to stop lying, it's not easy. Because you, when you really, I bought a notebook like this, like what Nathan has here, this little one that costs a shekel, and I would write my lies. And every time that I would lie, I would write down the lie and the hour. And comes, came Kriyat Shema Lamida, and I would sit with this uh, notebook, and read the lies and see how many lies I say and well, what nonsense. And I was like, okay, this has to stop. This has to stop. Uh, every word that comes out of my mouth has to be met. You really think that your tefillah will be accepted by Shamaim, in Shamaim, when the same mouth lies? 
and the same mouth curses and the same mouth slanders, how would your tefillah go up to Shemaim? And then people say, I prayed, Hashem didn't listen to me. Well, it's not that he didn't listen to you. The words were so heavy because of the junk that comes out of your mouth. The words didn't even go up to, to the next level. The way it works, so when you pray, your words from the prayer goes up to a, a Beit Din, to a court. And they analyze your prayer, and they decide if the words will continue to the next level. So they filter 90% of the words. They say, these 90%, these cannot go up. So 10% go to the next Beit Din, above it. They filter that, whatever stays from that, that goes to the next Beit Din, and to the next Beit Din, till it comes up to Shemaim. Kesakavod, to the chair of uh, glory. Then maybe 1% of your prayer, maybe got it up there. Because the words are too heavy with lying and cheating and, and cursing. So how do you expect, not you, I'm saying, how does a person expect that his tefillah will come up to Shabbat when a minute before that, that same mouth lied? What are you using? The, the, it's, you're using the tool that I gave you to praise me to go against what I'm telling you? I mean, that's why a person that zip, zips his mouth, what is the, uh, the Ramban says? Zip it. You know, just don't know. If it, the, the mouth is the most deadliest weapon. The Talmud says, Life and death is in the hands of the, of the tongue. Rabbi Eliezer says, That my whole life I've grown around Chachamim. Chachamim is like, uh, uh, not a, a genius in the mathematics. Chachamim is uh, the, the, the great sages. And I only, uh, the best, that I, best thing that I found for the body is silence. Just, that's it. Ma mo monitor your words. So a, a smart person doesn't talk much. That's when, when it comes now to, to the teachings of Kabbalah, everybody wants to learn Kabbalah. And everybody thinks that they're learning Kabbalah. They don't understand that the ones that really know Kabbalah, they don't talk. The ones who don't know anything, these are the ones who talk. So it's very easy to throw big terms in Shemaim. Go to a real Mekubal. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know, I don't know anything. Because the one, the one who really knows will not say anything. Nevertheless, the met is that you follow the Torah 100% and you lo lo don't move right or left and you every action every thought every word you analyze it right away and says is that is that the truth is that really the truth and i'm not telling you it's easy it's one of the hardest things to be a, a man of truth a ishemet i'm telling you i had this notebook and i found so many lies every day and just to write the lie you have to be truthful because, uh, because the, the, the Midat HaSheker will come and say, no, it wasn't really like that. <laughs> it was, uh, no, write it exactly how it is, emit. Now, when you put it down in writing, you actually read the lie. You're like, oh my gosh, how pathetic it is. How ridiculous is how, how, what I said. That's when you really see, my gosh, I'm a liar. This is disgraceful. And, and I told you that so many times in my personal experience, if I have to summarize the whole thing, what is one thing you can take from it? It's just truth, just admit. The whole feeling that was negative in Shemaim, that felt like torture, is that I was a liar. And I didn't, wasn't accepted in the heavenly realm because in Shemaim there's not such a thing as a lie even. Here in this world we mentioned that Rabbi Nachman says, any Yehush Ba'olam, Hashem didn't even create Yehush in Shemaim, there's no such a thing as a lie. It's called the Eulam Ha'emet. This Hashem, when He created the concept of lie, it is in this world, Alma de Shikra. This is the world of the world of lie. In the world above, there's no such a thing even. So how are you going to exist in the world above if you're a liar? Needless to say, the, the shame, the, this feeling that in Shemaim, they're looking at you, you lied? You distorted the truth? The word of Hashem, you distorted? That's how they, you looked upon from Shemaim when you lie. Shamayim, they look down and they're saying, Hashem has decided the world will look like this and you, <coughs> you distort it. So uh, this, this, this is the, one of the worst things one can do. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's, this is one of the commandments that you're not allowed to lie. Okay, so the, the Shad says, don't testify 
a false testi testimony. It's basically saying, you know, don't lie. So the point to take from that, we're totally sidetracked, but for a very good place. Because, uh, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu is my example. You see that many of our sages or many of our forefathers and tzaddikim got a title. Avraham Avinu, Yosef HaTzadik, Shmuel HaNavi, David HaMelech. Everybody got titles, not everybody, but a lot got titles. Look at the title of the person and see what he's about. And Moshe got a title, Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu means our teacher. Now today you walk in the street with a beard, everybody screams to you, Rabbeinu! <laughs> so this is not the Rabbeinu, there's only one Rabbeinu, it's only Moshe. Moshe is our teacher. Look at Moshe Rabbeinu, that's how the Torah has to be. Humble, quiet, emet. Moshe is emet. The sons of Korach screamed, Moshe emet ve Torato emet. It's all about emet. Apply that in your life, you'll reach to very high levels in your spiritual Avodat Hashem. Is to apply the Midat Emet. Not saying it easy. I'm just saying that's what one needs to strive for. To be 100% humble, Midat Anava, and 100% Emet, truthful, you'll see your life is a different life. That's why I fall asleep within a fraction of a second. I told you that so many times. My wife always complains. How do you fall asleep so fast? You don't even put your head down and you're already... She's like, it takes me half an hour. I toss, turn, this direction, that direction. I flip sides. She was like, I've never seen anything like it. And I always tell her the same thing. Well, first of all, I only have two hours to sleep, or three hours, is, and every minute here is valuable. But more than that, I have no, I'm not worried about anything, because I don't lie. When you lie, your conscious doesn't put you at ease, because you're a liar. Not you, I'm not tell, to pointing at anybody. I'm not saying you, I'm saying, somebody. When a person lies, his conscience is bothering him constantly. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're not at, you're not at ease. So you feel some type of uh, anxiety. Most people, they have suffering from anxieties. Some it's a little bit, some it's a lot. Because the soul is like, it's not comfortable in its own body. When the person is truthful, I'm not worried. I don't know anybody anything. I didn't do anything to anybody. I'm truthful. I, I make my tshuva right away. And so when it comes to sleep, <laughs> I don't think, my mind is not thinking, oh my gosh, what did I tell that person? I cheated that person. I lied here. I did this. I'm not behaving nice here. So trust me, you sleep much better when you're truthful. Bezat Hashem. We'll continue the Ma'amar tomorrow, even though we touch the most important thing, is don't be impulsive. Asura, na, let me move and see and observe and then I will ere, I will look and we'll see what's going on. The Torah is telling us a story, but in the story there's all these powerful teachings. It's not just a story about Moshe Rabbeinu walking, walking in the mountain and looking at a bush. Bezrat Hashem, I mean we started by saying that it's the Yetzer Hara that pretends I mean, we totally got off a little bit of the subject, but don't forget, at the beginning, we were talking about that the Yetzer shows to you himself like a burning bush, excited to do mitzvot, and the Yetzer convinces you, go and pray, go, become a, a good Eved Hashem, and he fools you. Sometimes for half a year, a year, I once, I remember when I became observant, he got me, I was like maybe three or four years observant, and I had a period that I felt like I'm like a tzaddik. I didn't even once, I didn't even sin in anything. I was like a machine gun, ta -ta 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 -ta, you know. I not, not even, I literally felt that I'm like becoming, I was like, wow, look, I conquered my tshuva. And not, there was not one thin, th thing that I sinned in. And uh, you know, he caught me completely off guard. The Yetzirah was feeding me and feeding me and feeding me. I thought I'm so high. And then without even noticing, you know, it slashed me in half. Uh, he attacked me. I was so off guard that he got me everywhere. And within a couple of weeks, I was almost, like I was from here, I went here. I couldn't believe how he, he fooled me, the Yetzirah. He literally made me feel like here, that you became a tzaddik, and that's it. You conquered everything. And then, you know, when you're not, off, when you're off guard, that's when he, you know, when the... 
when we were kids, we used to put in other kids' bike a uh, stick in the wheel, and then they they went flying. So that's a, a part of the tshuva that we had to do. So this is a, you know, in Hebrew it's a term. You put a stick between the the hoops, and you know, and then a crash. The Yetzirah knows how to put the stick in. We don't even notice. He puts the stick in and, and you fall. And we just have to be aware, but you know what? It all is connected. When you know to back off and to be aware of what's going on and to absorb, uh, observe the situation, it also do doesn't let the Yetzirah grow too much. Because you know constantly to, to put him down. Because every day, I'm not telling you it's healthy to be bad, hard on yourself, but you need to have, be firm with yourself. You need to have a little bit of tochecha every day. That's why three times a day we say, Ashamnu, Baganu, Gazalnu. You think I need to apologize to Hashem? I'm saying, Ashamnu, Baganu, Gazalnu to remind me how bad I am. So I can put myself in the right, right perspective to say, don't, don't uh, get a big head now. So what if you learn Torah now for four hours? I have to put myself in the right perspective. I have to constantly give myself tochecha. Because uh, approving, because if I don't do it to myself, Hashem will send somebody to do it to me. So better to take it on yourself and to constantly keep yourself in a level that, okay, I'm not that great. Besides the fact that the more, the more great you think you are, that's how we see in the observant world. And unfortunately, half of our leaders are so arrogant and so, uh, 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 you know, out of, their ego is so out of control. Because the Torah knows very quickly to, like flames, to take you up. The Yetzirah knows to make uh, people feel very great. And when a person is, doesn't work on that Midat Avanava, they, yeah, they might be a genius in the Torah. That's why I said the other day when we were learning that the Yeshivot today, they know how to, produ to produce genius arrogance. So because they're so genius in the Torah, the arrogance and the ego is out of control. It's very hard to find a... Uh, uh, a gadol in the Torah, a genius in the Torah, or a great rabbi that is, uh, doesn't think of himself that he's, you know, the, the God's gift to the world. That's the problem. The Yetzirah knows how to distort the situation, get you in his, in his trap. And that's why we, we have to be the same way. We're not, uh, we have to uh, constantly know that just be, just be humble. I always tell myself in the morning, you know, not that great. Don't think you're great. I told you that I had a... Uh, there was a rabbi in uh, New York, and uh, he was known to be the matchmaker. Probably did hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, shiduchim. And he, everybody liked him. He was an older guy, like a grandpa type, long white beard, and, and everybody loved him. And he used to prepare the couples before they went out on a date. So he would take them separately, of course, right before the first date and stand in front of a mirror, hold them, you know, caress them, put the hand on them, and of course not on the girls, but stand in front of the mirror and say, look at yourself, you know, ready for the date, yes. Now look very good at yourself at the mirror and just tell yourself you are not that great. <laughs> You're not that great before you go to the date. Don't come to the date that you're like a Wonder Woman or Superman. You're not that great. It's good to tell to yourself a couple times a day, you know, that great. So the ego constantly is going to tell you how amazing you are. You have to tell, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm okay. You know, you should make a shmate out of yourself, but uh, not to think, not to let the, uh, the success go up to your head in any type of way. Zad Hashem should marry to just uh, practice the midah of the emet, to be anshe emet, to be humble, to have the midah of anava. This is really how we get the, the, the right to become the right Eved Hashem. Needless to say, if we learn a little bit from Moshe Rabbeinu, maybe we can convince the Kadosh Baruch Hu that uh, we should get the, the last Redeemer. Should we see Mashiach with our own eyes very soon.